We bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we've heard your word read, and the psalmist there has clearly said, forget not all his benefits. And we are gathered this morning, Lord, to, to remind ourselves and one another of the many benefits you have given to us. As we come to your word now, still our hearts and minds that we might hear what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. The theme then is thanksgiving. There's probably some people here today and listening to this uh, on the internet who would think that they have very few reasons to thank God. I mean, when you look at 2020 and all its challenges and the huge impact of COVID on our world, um, decimating the world and its economies, 1,55 million people have died of COVID. I'm told at the moment two people die every minute in California alone of COVID. 67.8 million people across the world have um, contracted that uh, deadly virus, and, and even more all the time. Uh, only 25 in our country have lost their lives. And when you keep perspective there, 100 people die every day in New Zealand of all kinds of diseases, heart diseases and cancers and so on. 100 die every day in our country. So when you think of COVID, it has hardly had an effect on our land. And we've got an enormous amount to be grateful to God for. This country, New Zealand, is the envy of the world not only because of our beauty and the calmness of our country and the relaxed at atmosphere, but because of our position with regard to COVID. God's protection, power, provision must cause us to re reflect. That psalmist where David says, and forget not all his benefits. David is actually saying to himself, he's not saying to the people, he's actually saying to himself, I mustn't forget. And I hope, my dear friend, you don't forget. It may surprise you to realize that ingratitude and unthankfulness the Bible relates to as paganism, ungodliness. The Bible speaks of ungodly behavior, and in the list of ungodly behavior is ingratitude. Listen to this. Romans chapter 1 and verse 21, speaking of ungodly behavior, and then it goes on and says, and though they knew God, they neither glorified God or gave thanks to him. So he relates they neither recognized God or thanked God. That is ungodliness. The ungodly expect and take. The godly are grateful to God. John, Dr. John MacArthur, I think one of the greatest um, Bible teachers in the world today, said this. I believe thanksgiving is the single greatest act of worship that any Christian can perform. The single greatest act of worship is a grateful Christian. In um, 1 Thessalonians 5, near the end, he sort of closes off the book with some sharp, quick little comments, and he says this, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It's God's will for you and for me to be grateful, thankful people. When you consider it, if you have food in your refrigerator, clothes on your back, and a roof over your head, you are more blessed than 75% of the world. If you have money in the bank, some money in your billfold or your cell phone, some money at home, you're in the top 20% of the world. If you have never experienced danger of battle, loneliness, imprisonment, agony and torture, and the pangs of starvation, you are better than over 500 million people. If you can attend church meetings without fear of harassment, without being arrested, you are more blessed than 3 billion people, half the world's population. You add those things up, we are amongst the privileged of this world. Why then should we give thanks? I want to suggest some reasons, some reasons for thanksgiving. The first reason for thanksgiving is God's protection. 
God has protected us and continues to protect us. Psalm 91 says, The Lord is my refuge, and you make me dwell in peace. No harm will come near you. God looks after his own. I'm not saying we won't have hardships, but I am saying through the hardships, amidst the difficulty, God is with his own. Psalm 121 says, The Lord will keep you. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over, and I love the phrase, your coming and going both now and forevermore. And I've often pondered from Psalm 121, what does he mean by your coming and your going? Does he mean the coming into the world in your birth and your going as your death? Or does he mean... The coming and going of life. I think it means both. All the comings and goings of life, God watches over. Does it not say in Psalm 139, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. God protects us in all our ways. Think with me for a moment. How many times and little journeys have you made in the car? How many times have you gone places? Have you not known the protection? Have you, how many times have you walked on the pavement? How many times, for some of us this year, we've flown in airplanes, traveled on trains and on buses? We've known the pres preservation of the Lord. And we must know, thank God, for his protection. The Bible says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. If you've got nothing else to praise the Lord for, won't you say in the quietness of your heart, Lord, thank you that you've been with me in the coming and going of life. Secondly, thank God for his provision, his provision. This year, with all its many challenges, he has not left us hungry. He has not left us deprived. We have not been homeless, we have not been without clothes, and we have known some comforts. I'm not saying we've had every comfort, but certainly we've been lavished with so much. It struck me the other day, in that I was rearranging my clothes in the cupboard, and I was putting to the back of my cupboard my winter clothes. You've done that, and you've put to the other side your summer clothes. And I thought, there it is. I have a winter wardrobe and a summer wardrobe. I am blessed. I can remember coming from South Africa where people didn't have a change of clothing. Our Lord never had a change of clothing. And I've got a winter wardrobe and a summer wardrobe. How prosperous we are. Has the Lord not said in Matthew 6, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll drink or what you'll eat or what you will wear. Has he not given us the clothing on our back? God has provided so much. I love the psalmist. He says, I was young and now I'm old. Yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. Oh, my dear friend, don't be like those Israelites. Remember those Israelites, how they copped and complained and grumbled and moaned and God sends manna which was like a sweet cake from heaven and they said, we hate this food that you've sent and then they said, we want meat so God sends in quail meat which is soft and tender and melts in the mouth and they said, we hate this. By the way, God, we want to go back to Egypt. We want the melons and the cucumbers of Egypt. We don't want this rotten food you give us. How ungrateful. He gives them sweet running water in the desert, and they say we want the brackish water of Egypt. Oh, my dear friends, let's not gripe and cop and complain when God has given us so much. Let's be grateful for the things that... That seemed hard. I, I read this. A person said, I'm very thankful for the taxes I pay because that means I'm employed. I'm very grateful for the clothes that don't fit so well because it means I have ample food. I'm very grateful for the lawn I need to mow and the windows I need to wash because I have somewhere to stay. I'm very grateful for the furthest parking I find in the parking lot because I can walk to the shop. 
I'm very grateful for the huge heating bill I have because I have a warm place to stay. I'm very grateful for this government because at least I live under a peaceful government. And this particularly applies to me. I'm very grateful for the laundry and the ironing that I've got to do. Because at least I have loved ones to care for. I'm very grateful for the alarm that goes off and wakes me up in the morning. Because at least I've got a job to go to. My dear friends, I think we need to reassess the many good things we have and say, Lord, thank you, not only for your protection, for your provision, but also thank you for your presence, the Lord's presence in our life, the Lord's companionship. This is a great blessing that we as Christians, above all others, above all others can know. We can know a sense of God with us. We're not alone. We're not alone. John 14 and verse 16, Jesus says to his disciples, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate, another comforter. In other words, like I have been with you as I have been your friend, as I've been your provider, as I've been your counselor, I am going to heaven, but I will leave another counselor with you. That is the Holy Spirit who will be in you. We're not alone. He has left his presence in us before... In the Old Testament times, the presence, the Shekinah glory of God was over the temple only, and the people would come and go to and from the presence of God. Now in the New Testament, since the day of Pentecost, every born-again, Christ-filled Christian has the Holy Spirit, and we have his daily presence, never to leave us, never to forsake us. Remember when we journeyed through Hebrews? We looked at Hebrews 30 and verse 5. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. A compound negative. Never, ever, ever, ever will it happen that I will walk away from you. Remember that great uh, passage, um, Matthew 28 and verse 20, the Great Commission, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, and surely I will be with you. And this is how it reads in the end. I will be with you always to the end of the eons. That's how it reads. To the end of the end of all time. When eternity ends, I will not forsake you. We can never be God forsaken. We have not been abandoned, neglected, deserted, and nor will that happen. Through all the trials and challenges, and as I look over the, the congregation, there's been some pretty huge challenges in this church. There's been some deaths. There's been some loss of loved ones. There's been loss of homes. There's been loss of jobs. There's been failing health. There's, there's been huge challenges. But this we can say, the Lord has been with us. He has shielded us, and he continues to do so. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn and settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. Or that timeless psalm, we know it so well. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the quiet waters. He restores my soul. He is with us. He is all present. This year, we have not been left as orphans. I love that word because Jesus said it to his disciples. He said, don't worry, my disciples. I won't leave you as orphans. We are not orphaned. We are not God forsaken. We have known his presence, his protection, his provision, his presence and his patience. Thank God for his patience. I think the Lord has had to have more patience with me than most. Incredibly patient. Sadly, we are slow to trust him, and yet he remains patient. We're, we're slow to pray. Are you slow to pray? Very often, prayer is the last thing I do when it should be the first thing. Yet he remains patient. I'm slow to learn. I'm slow to obey. I'm slow to call on him. I'm, I'm slow to comprehend his ways. But yet he's patient. 
and I'm sure you can testify as well. The Greek word is makrothumia, patience. Makra is big, macro means big. Thumia is to do with hot, thermos, thermos flask. Makra thumia, long to get hot. That's how God is with us. He takes a long time to get angry. He's incredibly patient. Or, or the other, long-suffering. King James put it that way. Long-suffering. That's how God is with us. Psalm 103 that Malcolm read to us, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. Again, Psalm 86. But you, Lord, are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger. And then again, Psalm 145 and verse 5. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. You see, this is the nature of the God we have to do with again and again and again. Despite my unfaithfulness, he remains faithful. My friend, surely you must breathe in your soul. Lord, thank you that you still stick with me. I've been a Christian now 40 years. How many times haven't I let him down? How many times haven't I deserted him? How many times haven't I done what Peter did when he warmed his hands by the fire and said, I don't even know the man, and he denied his Lord? How many times haven't I denied him by my actions? And yet today... He still says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. He says to me in, in Isaiah 49c, I've engraved you in the palms of my hands. I cannot forget you. A mother may forget her children. I cannot forget you. Because of your great compassion, Nehemiah says, you did not abandon us. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. I thank God for his... Incredible patience that has blessed me and continues to bless me. Surely you need to say the same. Lord, you have been patient with me. So patient. Despite my carping, despite the, the, the way I, I don't keep my promises to you, yet you've kept your promises to me. Thank you for your patience. And then the last one, the last one. Surely I, I wouldn't be a preacher worth my salt if I left this out. Um, Thank God for his pardon. Incredible pardon. I want to split pardon under two words. Judicial pardon first. What I mean by judicial pardon, God as the sovereign judge sees me as a sinner, but yet I come to faith and trust in Christ because he calls me to himself, and when he calls me to himself, he forgives me for all eternity. He pardons my sins. He separates my sins as far as the east is from the west, and judiciously he looks on me and he says, you are saved to all eternity. There is therefore now no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. The sovereign judge looks at me and says, Healed, cleansed, forgiven. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, and come hell or high water, it will never be removed. God's judicious, judicial pardon over my life. He's written my name down in the Lamb's book of life, and I have been regenerated. I have amnesty, lovely word. Praise God for that word. Amnesty. I live in the amnesty of the forgiveness of a loving Christ. But there's not only this judicial pardon, there's a parental pardon as well. Because on an ongoing basis, time and time and time again, when I, when I, when I err, when I make errors, when I blunder, when I fail, when I let him down, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on me. So he forgives me on a daily basis. That's why the Lord taught us in the Lord's Prayer to pray, forgive us our sins, because he knows we will fail, but he knows the Father will pardon us. Not that we sin that we might get pardon, God forbid, but when we sin, we get pardon. Has he not said in 1 John 1 and verse 8, if we confess our sin, and note, he's not writing that to the unsaved. That's not addressed to the unsaved if we confess. It's the we, the, the plural, the, the Christian community, the family of God. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to continue to forgive us our sin and to purify us from all unrighteousness. A daily pardon, an hour by hour pardon. Wow. Of all the people on the face of this earth, surely... 
Surely, my dear friends, we must, we ought to be the most grateful people who walk the planet because of his protection, his provision, his presence, his patience, and his pardon. I heard the story of a blind boy sitting on the steps of a cathedral with a little sign, I am blind, please help. And people would walk past and drop a coin or so in, but generally people just passed him by. A man came along and dropped a coin in, and then he stopped. And he said to the boy, son, you're holding a sign up. I want to change the sign. The boy said, go right ahead. So the man turned the sign around and he wrote something else on the sign and walked away. Well, by the afternoon when he came back, the hat was just full of money. And, and the, the boy recognized the man's voice and said, it's, it's, it's the same, you're the same man who changed my sign, aren't you, sir? And the man said, yes. And, and the little blind boy said, sir, what did you write on my sign? Well, well, how did you change it that people responded? And this is what he wrote. The man wrote these words on the little boy's sign. Today is a beautiful day. I can't see it. Can you? People realized how grateful they had to be. They had sight. That little boy didn't. And so they gave generously. My dear friends, think of the common blessings of this life. Should there not be the theme, the song, the tune of deepest gratitude. Fanny Crosby, you might know uh, uh, her name because she's written um, so many of the great hymns. At, at the age of six as a little girl, she went to a doctor, wasn't a real doctor, was a quack, was one of those <laughs> medicine magicians, you know. And instead of dealing with the disease she had in her eyes, that quack made her blind for the rest of her life. In Fanny's closing years, she said to those around her, when I get to heaven, I'm going to thank God for that doctor who made me blind. Because I've written 4,000 Christian hymns in my blindness to bless the Christian church. She learned to be grateful even for the setbacks. Oh, my dear friend. Let's be those who are forever grateful. I'll close with this. In South Africa, there was a man um, who used to come to the church. I had a, uh, an inner city church, a real, it was a difficult church. And, and this man and his wife, John Sickle, used to come. But he was in a wheelchair. And the one thing about John is you couldn't do anything for him or around him without saying thank you. And to my shame, I remember one day I said to him, John, please stop saying thank you. <laughs> he just, he was always, thank you, thank you, thanks so much, thanks for that. Thank, he, he was, although he was in a wheelchair, he bubbled thankfulness. The question I ask you, with all your faculties, would others accuse you of always saying thank you? Are you a grateful person? Shame on you if you're not. After all that he has done for us, the protection of God, the provision of God, the presence of God, the patience of God, the pardon of God, let 2021 be the year of gratitude for his goodness. Let us bow in prayer. Just a moment. You listen to your own voice. Hear your own mantra. Has it been one of complaint and criticism? Maybe in your home to your partner, there's been little words of thanks. Few, few times have you really said, thank you for all you do. As a parent, do you thank your children? As a partner, do you thank your partner? Do you thank those around you in the church? Do you thank your God? Does he hear daily your, your gratitude attitude? Oh, Lord, 
pardon us, we pray, for the many times we've had an expectant attitude, an attitude of the sense of deserving, where we deserve nothing but the punishment, and yet you have pardoned, provided, and given us so much. Hear from our hearts today our deepest sigh of gratitude. And may you often hear it from us in the year ahead. For Jesus' sake, amen.